Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said leave them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. You have your Bibles. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. We introduced to you last week uh, this message from the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it, when? Day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. And thou shalt observe to what? Do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have what? And so if you notice there, this passage lays out for us the key to success. Success in anything. Particularly success when it comes to operating in the promises of God. God was speaking this to Joshua as he and the Israelites were preparing to enter into the promised land. Anybody looking to enter into your promises? There are some promises that God wants us to enter into. And he says here that the key to entering into the promise is that we do three things. That we got to make sure that we think the right things. We got to make sure that the right things are in our mouths. And we have to make sure that we are observing to do the right things. So in short, the secret to success is making sure that we think, speak, and do. And that's what we're talking to you today about from the subject think, speak, and do. Think, speak, and do. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. And we're starting with this first item on the list. Think. Think. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Verse 18. And it reads... But those things which, what, proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. Verse 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. I don't know if you caught that. He's saying here, Jesus is speaking, and he's saying that the things that we are saying, the things that we are doing are coming forth out from our hearts. We're focusing on the things we're saying, trying to, thinking that if I just say the right thing, I'm going to have success. We're focusing on things that we're doing. If I do the right things, we're going to have success. But Jesus is pointing out the root of the issue. The root of the issue is not what you're saying with your mouth or doing with your actions. The root of the issue is what you're thinking in your heart. That's where we start. I'm not saying it's the only thing we need to do to have success. I'm saying that's the place to start. And how many know you need to know where you need to start? Because many times the reason why we're not having success is because we're beginning in the wrong place. You know, if you don't start in the right place, you won't get the right outcome. And he says, before you get busy saying, before you get busy doing, understand what the root of your issue is. 
It's coming out of your heart. So you know what that tells us? That our real issue, our real problem, the reason why we're having a problem with our mouth is because we got a problem with our heart. Problem with our thoughts. Reason why we got a problem in our behavior, because we got a, a problem with our heart. Proverbs chapter 23, turn over there. What we think with our heart is so important. Why is it important, Pastor? Because of what we read right here in Proverbs 23 and 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So is he. Who are we? We're what we think with our hearts. So often, we want people to know us by what we say. So often, we're trying to present ourselves. We want people to uh, 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 know us by what we do. But the Bible says who we really are is not what we say, not what we do, but what we think. You know what that tells us? It tells us we don't know people as well as we think we do. Because guess what you can't know? You can't know what people are thinking. You don't know what's in a man's heart. You only know what they say. You only know what they do. So that tells us we're in no position to truly judge a person. Because only God knows and only they know what's in their heart. That's why unless you have a revelation from God, you're unqualified to discern and judge another man. Because God says a man is not known by what they say or do. A man is known by what's in their heart. Because many times they'll say one thing, but there's another thing going on in their heart. They'll do one thing, but a whole other thing is going on in their heart. So when you're out there interviewing people, when you're out there dating people, what do you need to get? You need a revelation from God. God, I know what they're saying. I know what they've been doing, but Lord, who are they? Are they what they say? Are they what they do? And not only that, we know who we are by what's in our heart. What if God was judging us by what's in our heart right now? Who would we be? Will we be the person that everybody thinks we are, or will we be somebody else? What if God laid bare right now your thoughts? What you think? What's in your mind? Who would we be? I'll tell you this. This is something even more. You really need to think about this. Not only are our thoughts revealing who we are, our thoughts are determining who we will be. Amen. Did you catch that? Yes. They're not only revealing who we are right now, what we think is determining who we will be. And so I want to talk to you about we are changed by our thoughts. Romans chapter 12. We're talking about the the importance of thinking. Why is it important that we think the right things? Because we are changed by what we think, by our thoughts. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans 12 and 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing, how are we transformed? By the renewing, we are transformed, we are changed by the renewing of our minds. You're being changed right now. If you are allowing the words that's going forth today to change your mind, guess what you are? You've already started the transformation process. 
Some of you came here today because you wanted to get better. I'm telling you, as you sit here today, if you are allowing the word to change your mind, you're starting the transformation process. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is how you start the change. Why are you going to church? Because, man, I'm trying to change. But I still see you doing the same way. Ah, but something's going on on the inside. It's uh, the, the, the preacher told me the other day that it don't start with what I see. It doesn't start with what I say. It starts by what I think. I got to get the right thinking. I got to get my thinking down. And we see, we want to rush people to say stuff. We want to rush people to do stuff, but we don't want to rush them to think stuff. I need you to get your mind right. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, get your mind right. Got to get your mind right. Get your mind right. Got to get your mind right. Gotta, come on, touch your head, grab your say, I got to get my mind right. No, say it again. Close your eyes when you say it. Say, I have to get my mind right. This is why we're starting and stopping. This is why what we're doing is not having any real effect because we haven't got our minds right. We're doing it, but our minds are still at home. Jesus says, you worship me with your lips, but your heart, your mind, your thoughts are far from me. Before you come to him with your mouth, come to him with your Lord, I'm coming to you with my mind. And see, some of you, you're still sitting there. You, you refuse to come in your mind. Oh, you're sitting here today, but your mind's like, I don't know if I want to be a part of this. See, this is, why, this is what's holding you, keeping you up. You, you won't enter in. That's why you can't be changed. You changed your clothes, but you haven't changed Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. If you want to change who you are, start by changing how you think. Now, let me just clarify this because it's so important because we've we got all kind of people here today. And I fear that somebody is listening to me say this, or maybe they'll be watching this online, and they will confuse or they will equate what I'm saying here today about the importance of changing our mind and being transformed by our mind. They will equate that to what the world today thought leaders call manifesting. Yeah, some of you are familiar with that. Some of you old timers, you may not be familiar with that phrase, manifesting. You may be more familiar with the old school phrase, the power of positive thinking. Yeah, see, so now I got some of you. Okay, yeah, okay. So they, they, got, they got modern day thought leaders. They, they, they changed the word, but it's the same philosophy. They call it manifesting. They get their little vision boards out, and, and so they, they believe that whatever they want, they can manifest it. Manifestation or manifesting is a belief, an ideology that believes that you are able to change your reality, change your job, your career, relationships, even the health in your body by thinking the right things. You can manifest your dreams. Whatever you want, manifest it. Put it in front of you every day. Look at it. Envision it. Think on it. And it will materialize. And they'll say, man, that pastor is, he own it. He knows all about this, this new revelation. A man, that ain't nothing but manifesting. You know, like, like the movie, that, that ain't nothing but an ultra perm, you know. <laughs> no, this ain't no ultra perm. And this ain't no manifesting. I said what I'm saying here today is not manifesting. Manifesting is witchcraft. Yeah, I know. You don't want me to say it, but I'm here. It, it doesn't matter. Look, I'm not here to condemn nobody. I'm here to, I'm here to instruct you so that we won't be fooled. Because so often what the enemy does, he'll take things, principles that seem to be in line with Scripture, and he'll start purporting them to, to, to society, to men, and make you think that you're still walking with God when you're not. 
is called a counterfeit. So, so don't get off into this manifesting because that's witchcraft. And the reason why I call it witchcraft, not just, be, just to be demeaning, it's witchcraft because it's manipulation. The people who purport this ideology will tell you that when you're manifesting what you actually are doing, you are collaborating with the universe. And when they say the universe, they mean God because they see God as pantheistic, meaning God is everything. God is not the Father. God is not the Son. God is all things. God is the universe, all creation, the trees, the grass, the flowers, the birds. And God is a force. God is an energy. And since thoughts are energy, if you change your thoughts, you can change the energy, you can change the universe, and you can make it what you want. That's idolatry. That's, that's trying to create your reality by not going to God, by going to some other form, as spells, witches, whatever you want to call it. You can call it manifesting, but back in the day, they just went to the witch. But it's trying to get your needs met other than from God. That's called witchcraft and idolatry. So stop trying to get your needs met by people or things other than God. Number two, say two. two. The other reason why this is witchcraft is because, because it purports this idea that you're able to manipulate God into giving you what you want. You can't do that. I said you can't do that. You cannot, even if you say, well, I'm not going to, I'm not praying to the universe. You know, my vision board has God and has, you know, scriptures on it. But guess what you can't do? You can't go to God and ask him to give you things to satisfy your flesh. Go with me to James chapter 4. You, you, you're misunderstanding the whole point of changing your mind. You don't change your mind so you can get what you want. You change your mind so God gets what he wants. There's only one person on this planet that gets to do what he wants and gets to have what he wants, and that's God. And if you want what you want, then you got to want what he wants. When you want what he wants, then you get what you want. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you. Why? Because your desires will match his desires. Because his desires are the only desires that he's manifesting. He's not manifesting your desires. He's not giving you what you want. He's only giving what he wants. But when you want what he wants, he'll give you what you want. He says, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, then when you ask what you will, it will be done. Why? Because I'll be getting what I want because we're one. See, we're not changing our mind to convince God and manipulate God. We're changing our mind because we've been in opposition to God. And we realize that if we're ever going to have success, our minds got to match his mind. James chapter 4. So you tell that to your thought leaders when they try to tell you that this is the same thing. It's not the same thing. James chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and receive not. Or you could say you think and you don't get it. Why? Because you ask amiss, you think amiss, that you may consume it. You think God is going to give you things to satisfy your flesh? He is not. He's trying to kill the flesh, not satisfy it. You will never manipulate God into giving you what you want if what you want is just to satisfy some carnal desire. I want to prove to everybody that I'm somebody. That's, that's why you're not going to get it. Because guess what? Say what? You're nobody. And the only person that's somebody is God. The Bible says he called them who were no people, the people of God. So guess what we were before God found us? Nobodies. You were nobody. He wasn't even thinking about you. He had no plan for you. He had no covenant for you. He had no promise to you. He appeared to Abraham and his family. Oh, but God who is rich in mercy. I said, God who is rich in mercy turned from his people and went to a bunch of nobodies and said, do you want to come and join the party? 
I don't know if I want to receive that. See, this is why you're in opposition. You won't receive God's testimony about you. Romans chapter 1. Now, it's important as we understand this whole idea about being changed by our thoughts to understand that like our thoughts have the power to change us for the better, our thoughts also have the power to change us for the worse. I need you to hear me on this. Just like thoughts have the power to change you for the better, they have the power to change you for the worse. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge or in their thoughts, God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not that's a fancy, archaic way of saying doing those things that are immoral. Inconvenient means the lack of all morality. Being the nastiest of all. And you can see here, even in our generation, as this generation refuses to retain God in their thoughts, they will think on everything, they will give everything a platform in their mind, but refuse, refuse to allow God any space in their mind. And God says, if you don't allow any space for me in my mind, if you abandon me, I'm going to abandon you. And when I abandon you, you're going to be terrible. Meaning, when your thoughts does not contain God, when your mind is not on God, that's how you become terrible. Why am I so terrible? Because your mind is not on God. See, you think it's because of some addiction or some, you know, weakness towards, I got a weakness for uh, alcohol. I got a weakness for weed. I got a weakness for the opposite sex or the same sex. No, no, no. Your real issue is you don't give no place for God in your mind. Because if you allowed space in your mind for God, then he wouldn't let you fall into those weaknesses and immorality. You are doing those things because you're trying to do it without God. You, you, you say, I don't need God. Uh, I don't want no time for God. Uh, Big Mama was trying to invite you to church. Oh, I ain't got no time for no church, Grandma. I ain't got no time for that, Grandma. Go on somewhere with that. See, this is why. This is why you're the way you are. Because you said, I don't want God in my mind. So you're becoming corrupted by your thoughts. By your thoughts. Which brings me to my next point. We are also condemned by our thoughts. Not only are we corrupted by our thoughts, we're condemned by our thoughts. We're here in Romans. Go back to verse 18. Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Jump down to verse 21. What unrighteousness is it? When they would knew, when they, but when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their thoughts or in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 18 tells us that the wrath of God not will be revealed, is being revealed. And the wrath of God is another way of saying the judgment of God. God's judgment is being revealed on mankind. Who in particular? Those who will not retain God in their imagination. They won't think on him. They refuse to think his thoughts. And God says, I'm coming. Did you know that the fastest way to receive judgment is to think on the wrong things? A lot of the judgment that has taken place in our life many times is because of the things we think on. 
See, we have this idea that as long as we don't touch it, as long as we don't do it, it's okay to think it. We think about doing all kind of harm, all kind of violence, all kind of evil, all kind of immorality, and we think it's okay to think it but not do it. But God says his judgment is being revealed even when you think it. Mm, mm, mm. Turn with me to Proverbs 24. Yeah, see, this is, you know, this is, you know, a lot of times we know, why, Lord, why, Lord? Because what you've been thinking. Mm, mm, mm. We go to him and says, Lord, I didn't do nothing. Yeah, but you thought something. How many have one of those parents that got you because you finna do it? I said, how many had one of them parents that corrected you, not for the stuff you did, they corrected you for stuff you were finna do. You got a backhand, why did I do, I didn't do nothing, my, yeah, you were finna do it. <laughs> Some of you don't know what finna means, it's fixing, fixing, preparing, scheming, scheming and weeming, scheming to do it. We were over there like, mm, just wait till she turn her head. Fix, that's fixing, that's finna. Finna for short, finna do it. And all you were doing is, you were putting it together in your head. You were fixing it more. You're, you're, yeah, you got it. You got it for fixing. God, God's one of those parents. He, he gets you for, for finna doing it. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor you making stuff up. Okay, am I? Uh, Proverbs 24, verse 9. Proverbs 24 and verse 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. The thought of foolishness is a sin. Now, we, we got we to we we clarify this. We, we got we to we dig into this. Now, the word thought here in Proverbs 24 and 9 this word thought means scheme or plan. To prove it to you, I'm going to read the same verse in the Amplified Version. This is a different version. It says, the plans of the foolish and the thought of foolishness are sin. So he's not just talking about random thoughts that come in your head. He's talking about the plans, the schemes of sin. See, a lot of times the enemy will try to condemn us because a thought will pass through our mind. I mean, man, you're praying, and then next minute you got some obscene thought that come in your mind, and you're trying to see God. And then you feel all the time, oh, God, in the name of Jesus, oh, God, forgive me, forgive me. How did, where that thought come from? Has that ever happened to you? Don't raise your hand. Just, if, as a, don't, don't. Because they're going to look, they're going to be like, that's my squad member, my God. You're going to be the subject of prayer at the next squad meeting. <laughs> but without raising your hand, how many can admit that that has happened to you? I mean, even while you're in church. I mean, you're worshiping God, and then just this obscene thing come through your mind. Just obscene thought come through your mind. It don't always have to be sexual. It could be violence. It could just be, you know, just dumb stuff. I can't wait to party. Oh, where did I get that from? Lord, I know I don't go to that party. And you start thinking about Usher, and you start thinking about Jay-Z and Beyonce. And you, you, uh, Beyonce song come to your mind when you, here's my word. Where does that come from? And then you're thinking about a lyric from Beyonce. And so we think that that random thought is the sin. No, that's not the sin. It's not a sin for you to think a random thought or for a random thought to come to your mind. What's the sin? The sin is when you take that random thought and you think long on it. You take that th random thought and you start putting that thing together. And now it's not just a thought, it's become a plan. It's become a scheme. Now your thought has created desires and passions and lust. This is how you can tell when you've gone too far with your thought. When your thought has become a sin, you can always tell because it invokes an emotion in you, a passion, a lust. I got to do it. You start seeing yourself doing it. How many know you don't necessarily get burned by touching the oven? It's when you keep your hand there. You kept your hand there. 
I said, had you pulled it away, how I many know it wouldn't have, it, you'd have been all right. Put a little cocoa butter on it, you're fine, you're gone. But if how I many know if you hold it there? Oh, now you're going down the hurley. You got to, you third degree. And why? Why? Because it was hot? No, because you kept it there. God says, when, you, when your mind gets hot, pull it away. Loose here, devil. Come on out. And you just keep going. Don't hold it there. You holding it there, not knowing that you're burning yourself. You're damaging your soul. Matthew chapter 5. Am I helping anybody? Let me know if I'm doing any help. Am I helping you? I mean, oh, God's trying to help us here. The devil wants to condemn you. The devil wants you to think that, oh, you're a criminal and you're crazy and you're bipolar and you're schizophrenic. Just because you got a thought in your mind. Now, the sin ain't the thought. The sin is the lust. Ah, I'm about to show you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his, in his mind, in his thoughts. The heart is the seat of your thoughts, the seat of your emotion. Heart, your thoughts. He says, when you look it on her to lust, the word lust means a passionate desire. And it doesn't just have to be sexual, as I said. A lot of times we think that the only thing we can't, you know, lust after, or the only thing we can lust after is, is sexual. But how many know you can lust after doing people violence? You can lust after lying. You can, it's all, you can lust to do anything. And that's when sin becomes, that's when thoughts become a sin, when they become passions, lusts. And the reason lusts are sins, because lusts are a choice. I need somebody to hear me on this. The reason our lusts are sins is because our lusts are choices. Not all thoughts are choices. Like I said, you could be minding your own business and a thought can come in your mind. Not all thoughts are, cho are choices, but lust is always a choice. Because you decided to stay there for a while. You didn't know by turning that channel that was going to happen. Ah, uh, but you made a choice. And they keep it there. Stay there. Their hands go up, and they stay there, <laughs> and they stay there, and they stay there. Oh, no, put them down in Jesus' name. <laughs> they stay there. Okay, you got to pull them down. You got you to gotta turn that thing. Lust is always a choice. Thoughts aren't always choices. Now, whenever I read this passage, remember we read Matthew 5, 28. When you lust on a woman, you've committed the adultery in your heart, Jesus says. And so the question that often arises when you hear a passage like that is, if you're thinking on or lusting on a particular thing, is that the same as doing that thing? Because if, I, look, if I'm going to get it for thinking on it, might as well. Remember when we were teenagers and you, you knew curfew was gone, you, you might as well, I'm going to get B, I'm going to get B, I might as well get my money's worth. Because it's going to be the same whether I come in at one or two. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. How many know that 30 minutes ain't going to change? That, that hour ain't going to change. It's still coming down. 
And so we think that. We think, man, if, look, if I thought about cussing them out, might as well go ahead, get my money's worth. Get my money's worth. Because Jesus says it's the same. No, he didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't say it's the same. You assumed it's the same. He didn't say it's the same. I mean, when you, when you lust on things in your mind, you're sinning against God because only God can see it. You're his temple. You put that stuff up in his temple. But when you do it, now you've sinned against man. Now you've sinned against God and man. Now you've got two people to pay back. Huh? So doing it isn't the same as, thinking it isn't the same as doing it. However, however, there are consequences to thinking it, just like there are consequences to doing it. Isaiah 55, that's the point. That's the point. The point is there are consequences. Don't think just because you thought it, there are no consequences. No. There are consequences to thinking it, just like there are consequences to committing sin. It's not the same as committing it, but you can still go to jail. Amen. Hallelujah. Attempting to kill somebody ain't the same as killing somebody. But you can still, you're going to jail now. Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, verse 7, Isaiah 55, verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Notice what just happened. The prescription he gives for those who commit sin is the same prescription he gives to those who think it. So you know what we got to do? We got to start treating our sinful thoughts like our sinful actions. Just like we would ask God to forgive us for a sinful act, we need to ask God, Lord, forgive me for the imaginations of my heart. A lot of times we'll go by and we'll think all kind of things and we don't even pause to ask God, Lord, have mercy. Forgive me, Lord. You ought not do that. Because I'm telling you, the wrath of God is being revealed not just by what he see, by what we're thinking on. Amen? We've got to treat it the same. Got to, now he says here in verse, verse 7, he says, forsake your thoughts. Don't just ask God to forgive your thoughts. Leave them. Forsake them. Stop thinking on them. Well, that's easier said than done, preacher. How do we do that? Glad you asked. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. How do you stop thinking on these things once you start thinking on them? <laughs> you know how you stop thinking on them. Yeah, we, we say, you need to stop thinking on that. I'm trying. Huh? Anybody, had, anybody tried to forgive somebody but was struggling? You just couldn't stop thinking about what they did to you. How they borrowed your lawnmower and wouldn't. Bring it back. Matter of fact, your kids had toys and they kicking their toys. I, I'm mowing my lawn with my lawnmower. How do you stop thinking on it? How do you forsake your thoughts? Remember this, saints. Remember this. Sometimes the way to forsake an evil deed or an evil thought you got to get rid of the source. You see, you want to stop doing evil. You want to stop thinking on evil. You got to get rid of the source that motivated and tempted you to do it. You got to get rid of the source. Matthew 5 and 29. Matthew 5 and 29. If your right eye offend thee, do what? Pluck it out. And cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one member should perish and not your whole body 
cast into hell. Now, Jesus doesn't mean this literally. Don't go around poking your eyes out. Right? But, but he's, he's trying to get us to understand that if the problem, you got a problem looking on stuff, get rid of the source. Amen. Right? Sometimes we've got to get rid of some of these subscriptions to keep from watching them at 2 in the morning. I remember my, my grandparents, you know, they, they lived out in Vassar. And uh, back in the 80s, Vassar didn't have cable. Mm -mm, Comcast didn't go out that way. You had to get satellite to be out there. Of course, my grandparents were too sanctified <laughs> to ever get satellite or cable. So when we went out there, the only thing was out there is news and snow. <sighs> And even when the news came on, you couldn't hardly see it without the, without the hanger and the. So guess what? When you went out there, you stayed out of a lot of trouble by default. Just because you couldn't find any trouble. And because the house is out there, I mean, the next neighbor was, my God, it was, it was no kids out there. It was nothing out there. So you, you couldn't do any damage because there was nothing to be found. And I mean, no, that's how sometimes we got to do in order to keep ourselves from evil and thinking on evil. You got to get rid of the source. Turn off social media. Start deleting some of these subscriptions. Stop, start unfollowing because these folks, it just start popping up on your page. I mean, no, their nastiness will get on your page. I mean, like, my Lord, my Lord, look at that. It gets worse. Huh? You got to get rid of it. Amen? Got to get rid of it. Get rid of the source. Get rid of the source. Let me warn you, if you don't remove the source of sin, you'll be taken captive by sin. Brings me to my last point on thoughts. We are taken captive by our thoughts. Not only are we changed by our thoughts, not only are we condemned by our thoughts, but we can be taken captive by our thoughts. Those who think on sin will commit sin. Those who commit sin will be taken captive by sin. John chapter 8. I'll repeat that for some of you. If you think on sin, you're going to commit sin. When you commit sin, you run the risk of being taken captive, becoming us. That's how addictions get formed. Obsessions, the I can't help it. How did that happen? It started when you were thinking on it. That led to doing it, and doing it led to captivity. Now you can't stop. Now you can't stop. John chapter 8, verse 34, John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant, a slave of sin. Commit sin is a what? Servant of sin. We already know that thinking on sin leads to committing it. Here he says, when you commit it, then you run the risk of being a slave to it. Somebody once wrote this. I thought, I thought it was really great. Sin always takes you further than you want to go and keeps you longer than you want to stay. Sin always takes you further than you thought you were just going around the corner. Okay, I'll get in the back seat. And they just, I mean, where y'all going? I thought we were going around the corner. It takes you further than you want to go and keeps you longer than you want to stay, than you want to stay. And why is that? Well, I'll show you 2 Corinthians 10. I'm almost finished here. Second, why is it? Why is it that we are taken captive by our sin? Well, one of the things we need to realize is that whenever we sin, we open the door and give access to 
evil spirits. Every sin is an open door, an invitation, a dinner bell to evil spirits. Evil spirits accompany evil. So when you participate in a sin and evil, then there's a spirit that comes along with that. It's like when you lie, you open a door to a spirit of lying. When, when you fornicate, then you open the door up to a spirit of fornication. When you commit acts of violence, then you open the door to a spirit of violence. There, there, there's, there's spirits. Everybody says, oh, no, no, it's not. Oh, yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. There's spirits with these things. And they're attached to these things. And when you give in, this is why the Bible says, he says, he that lies, he says, don't lie. Neither open the door, give space to the, to the devil. He says, put away lying in Ephesians 4 and give no space to the devil. Me, why? Because anger, lying, that opens the door, gives space, a foothold to the devil. And when the devil comes in, say, I'm listening. When the devil comes in, he puts up fortresses around you to keep you doing that thing. And, he, and we're about to see where he does it. He does it in the mind. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare, so you're in a battle. Whether you realize it or not, you're in a warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of what? That's fortresses, encampments, right? Casting down what? Imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. A couple of things here, he says. First of all, he's saying that the enemy's plan is once he gets in, he wants to set up a stronghold. And where does he want to set it up at? In your imagination, in your thoughts, in your minds. And why does he want to do that? Because man was created with this capacity, or which we today, psychologists call it a subconscious. And the reason why you have a subconscious is what happens is the things that are in your mind that you do repeat, it goes into your subconscious. And why does it go there? To allow you to do things automatically to automate them. So like you can walk and won't have to like you was when you were two trying to figure out how to walk, you'll just do it naturally to speed things up. Like when you're working in a factory and you're doing the same thing over and over again, you, it'll take knowledge from your mind that you repeat and put it in your subconscious so you can do it without thinking. This is why you're able to drive your car and talk on the phone and do all this and, and do all this stuff. Why? Because your subconscious allows you to automate things. And see, the devil knows this. So if I can take this thought and put it in your subconscious, I can automate your sin. That immediately as somebody cross you, you cuss them out without doubt. You don't even have to think about it. It's just like a, a reaction. We call it instincts. Every time you see a, a beautiful woman, you, you're trying to sleep with them. It's like instinctively because it's in your thoughts. He's put a stronghold there. Yes, he's got you now, and he put, a, he put a whole encampment so you can't easily cast it out. It's in your subconscious. It's in your mind, in your imaginations. So that's the first thing. The second thing he tells us here is if you want to regain control, if you want to win the battle, what do you got to do? You got to take captive. First, you've got to cast down those thoughts that are trying to dominate your mind and take them captive. You're going to have to regain control of your thoughts. You're going to have to stop letting your thoughts just go whatever, and you're going to have to start giving orders to your thoughts like you give orders to your children. No, you're going to sit down. 
No, you're going to put that away. No, you're going to bed. You can't expect to do this automatically because your, your, your default is sinning. That's what's in your, so you got to take authority over this and retrain your mind. And in the beginning, it's going to feel very robotic. Like every time you go to work, you got you to beef yourself up. Now, when you go in there, when you go in there, you're going to keep your mouth closed. You're not going to say one word. You're going to sit there. You're going to do your job. You're going to be messing with it. You're going to be quiet. And, and you're going to almost have to do it. It's going to be robotic. You've got you to be watching yourself like, you, like when you were a parent. You was watching them. What, what you do, put your hands in your pocket. Don't touch a thing. And what are you doing? You're gaining control over your thoughts, not allowing your thoughts to go anywhere. The Bible calls it girding the loins of your mind. That's putting a belt on it, a girdle, not just being out there, just flopping. And bringing it under the authority of God's word says, God's word says, God's word says. And if you do that enough, Yes, you will build a different stronghold. If you do that enough, something different will be automatic. That when people cross you, you automatically pray for them. When they step on your feet, you automatically forgive them. Oh, you ever meet people like this? It's like you can't even get them to be mad. It's like they automatically, they automatically. Ah, because they've trained themselves. You should try it. Somebody say, it starts here in my mind. It starts here in my mind. you got to think on these things. He says in Philippians, whatever thing is true, whatever is honest, whatever is good report, think on these things. You know what? And I read this somewhere. Psychologists say, and I'm not I'm one to always quote psychologists, but I think they got it right here. They said the key to overcoming obsessions, you ever be obsessed with something, you can't stop thinking about it? So the key to doing that is learning to think on reality, whatever thing is true. See, the reason why we're so obsessed with stuff is because that's all we think. We don't think on reality. The reality is this is where you're living. This is what you have. Think on reality. Stop dreaming to be married to some superstar. You're not married to the superstar. Be real. We, we like to romanticize everything, and we don't live in reality. That's why we're so obsessed with things, because we don't live in reality. We don't train ourselves to think on what is true. We're always dreaming. We're in fantasy land, and we don't deal with the truth. We don't deal with reality. We deal with all these other things we have in our minds. We, we have this assessment of ourselves that we're more than what we and don't deal with the truth. Train yourself. Think on the truth. And what's God's truth? What's the truth? God's word. Lord, what did you say? It's not even what we see. It's what God says. Amen? Stand on your feet today. Hallelujah. How many realize we got work to do? And that it starts right in our minds, right between our ears. I want you to get a hold of that, believer. Let's get to the root of the issue. Before we run out here and start making these great promises... That from now on, I'm not going to do this. From now on, I'm not going to say this. How about we start from now on, I'm not going to think this. From now on, I'm going to think on this. Let's get to the root of it. Let's not skip over this step. This entire week, I want us praying about our minds. Even when our actions aren't changed, even when, even before we start changing our speech, this week I want us focused on one thing. Not on what we say, not on what we do, but
but on what we think. And let's just see that if we change and focus on what we are thinking the right things, what kind of impact they'll have on what we're saying, how we're feeling, what we're doing. What are we going to focus on this week? I think. What I'm thinking. What am I thinking on? What am I thinking on? What am I thinking on? Every head bow today. Father, we thank you today that you are training us to think the right things. Thank you for this teaching. Thank you for this revelation. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519. Harris Memorial Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love. Use me, Lord.